In many parts of the world, people are hungry. They face a risk of starvation. This is food insecurity, the lack of access to sufficient calories, protein, vitamins, and minerals. In some parts of the world, the semi-arid tropics, there is, on average, adequate rainfall to support the kinds of crops that will provide adequate nutrition. But that average is just that. It's an average. Some years it can be far too wet, like recent floods in Pakistan and elsewhere. And in other years, so dry that crops wither and die. Either extreme can lead to hunger, starvation. With climate change, this is perhaps our greatest existential problem that will only get worse. To deal with this, we need to reimagine agriculture to create more variable crops that can tolerate these coming conditions. One of these crops is chickpea, garbanzo beans. It is particularly sensitive to both too much water and too little. In wet years, like uh, the early season pictured here in Ethiopia, it's very susceptible to fungal pathogens that can wipe out an entire crop. If it's too dry, particularly at the end of the season, it will wither and die as well. No garbanzo beans, no chickpeas, even if the plants are growing well earlier in the season. We can, to some extent, based on El Nino and La Nina, predict which years will be wet and dry. If we can design more variable crops, we can provide farmers in the most food insecure parts of the world with crops adapted to the years and the kinds of climates that they're going to face. Yet, the entire history of agriculture goes against this. Since the first farmers 8,000 years ago, we've been reducing the amount of diversity in our crops. The first farmers took rare individuals in wild plant populations that happened to be good crops. They had seeds that stayed on the plants. They grew well under agricultural conditions. They did they thrived as traditional crops. 50 to 60 years ago, the end of the Second World War, this process intensified. This is the Green Revolution. We bred crops to tolerate the conditions of industrial modern agriculture, chemical fertilizers, pesticides, irrigation, crop plants on steroids. This is great. This feeds the world. We have the vibrant, healthy, well-fed populations that we have in much of the world due to this development. But it's homogenized agriculture reducing the diversity we have. The wild relatives of our crops still exist. We can find many of them in nature if we look. We may not know what to call them in some cases. They're very poorly studied. If we can bring them back, we can reimagine agriculture. So I've pictured here a crop chickpea and its wild relative from neighboring fields in southeastern Turkey. The crop, it's a good crop. It has good yields, it tastes good, it grows well under agricultural conditions, has big, juicy seeds. This wild relative, however, has great traits too. It's stress tolerant, it's resistant to diseases, it can be chewed on by cattle, sheep, even voracious caterpillars. It's disease resistant, but it has a low yield and relatively poor taste. We'd like the traits of both in, our, in the crops that we need to face climate change. To do this, we want to capture the traits of this wild chickpea. It's growing in a rock crevice at the top of a mountain, in no soil, almost no water. If we can create a collaboration, a functional one, between ecologists, evolutionary biologists like myself, molecular biologists, and most importantly, breeders, we can bring the traits from this plant into our cultivated chickpea. The first step in this collaboration is to systematically and thorough, thoroughly collect the wild relatives of our crop plants. 
For over 100 years, since at least the time of Darwin, we've known of the wild relatives of our crop plants. But many breeders are hesitant to use them, primarily for the poor agricultural traits that they have. Furthermore, the collections that we have of them haven't been made with ecological principles in mind. Often there are only a, the offspring of a handful of individuals, a single habitat, one roadside population. We need systematic, thorough collections from a wide range of habitats. And I have the pleasure of being an important part of a collaboration between molecular biologists at UC Davis, Michigan State, University of Southern California and elsewhere, breeders at Haran and Dijli University in Turkey, in Ethiopia, India, Canada and Australia, to systematically do this in chickpea. We've been in southeastern Turkey this year doing just this. To make this collection useful, we have to have the capacity to understand the genetic basis of the traits we're looking at. And we've uncovered, as an example, the genetic basis of flower and seed color variation in chickpea. Wild chickpea and some traditional varieties from India, Ethiopia, and, and Turkey have a dark purple color in, a, in their flower and their seed coat. The chickpeas we eat here and, and often elsewhere are uh, white instead, or tan colored. From simple uh, tissue samples, can extract the DNA and determine whether or not plants have the dark or the light colored form. We can do this in any crop for any trait of interest. Because of this, we can allow crosses of wild and crop chickpea to occur. We can perform them in the lab. We can collect the offspring, and we can screen for the, the offspring that have the traits we need, the stress tolerance of the wild chickpeas and the good agricultural traits of crop chickpeas. In doing this, we can create a variable agricultural system that has the seed traits that consumers in different parts of the world crave. We eat different chickpeas here in the West that are often consumed in Ethiopia, India, and elsewhere, but also have the stress tolerance that's needed in the face of climate change. It's important that we do this now because these wild crop relatives are under immediate threats. In southeastern Turkey, where 30 years of civil unrest and rapid development have led to mining, damming, road building, and agricultural intensification, these populations are rapidly disappearing. And it's not just chickpea. It's wheat, barley, peas, lentils. Wild relatives of all of our major crops are under immediate threat. We've lost already part of one of the 25 populations we've collected, and we'll lose several more from development in the next several years. If we don't act now to protect these wild relatives, both systematically bring them into breeding programs, as we're doing, and protect them in the wild, they'll be gone. If we succeed at this, we will have the capacity to provide farmers with climate resilient, stress tolerant plants that will thrive under the challenging conditions we expect from climate change, as well as variable crops that appeal to the tastes of consumers in local markets. And importantly, we'll lay the basis for the kinds of collaborations between breeders, ecologists and evolutionary biologists and molecular biologists that we need to pull this off. Thank you very much for your attention.